Please welcome my dear friend, Pastor Chris Hyatt, Covenant Life Church near Atlanta in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Truly one of the dearest friends I've ever had in my whole life. And I'm really trying to say a lot of nice things about Chris because he's about to introduce me. So, <laughs> Chris. Steven said not to go more than 30 minutes tonight, so. <laughs> He also reminded me he's taking me to lunch tomorrow. So based on what I say tonight, depends on where we go. So he sent me a whole bunch of nice things to say here. Let me see if I can get them. I mean, what an honor to be here with everyone tonight. Um, Stephen is my friend, 41 years now, we've been friends. We used to be the young guys running around here and something happened. Uh, I'm grateful for Stephen. He, of course, is, uh, a, is a real asset to so many people. He's got great gifts. Maybe some of his best work is in editing and writing, but he also is an amazing pastor. He's pastored in Texas and Alabama. He pastors pastors now, translocally, travels and speaks around things that are really dear to my heart, things like reconciliation, bridging to the next generation, which is so critical. Um, church planting. Um, Stephen is, uh, has got a heart to really uh, seek the Lord, and we've done that together. And so it's an honor to any, any time just be with him. But tonight, I want you to just join with me in welcoming my friend, Stephen Simpson. Thank you. Y'all are very kind. And I told Chris, thank you for not saying anything bad. <laughs> he told me earlier that he, he wasn't going to tell any of, any of my secrets. And I said, well, you know, if some of them will make me look impressive, go ahead and tell them. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I want you to turn in your Bible, if you would, please, to... 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians 12, the title of what I want to talk about for the next few minutes, <laughs> uh, the title of what I'm going to talk about tonight is Grace in Broken Places, Grace in Broken Places. I'm very grateful for all of you being here. I know that it takes a lot of time, money, effort to come and gather here, but this has become a place that's very special to us, and frankly, the main reason it's special to us is because you're here, and we thank you for that. I heard about a fella, he, uh, he broke his arm, and that's no fun, and so he went to the doctor the doctor said, yeah, he said, we can fix this, but uh, we're going to have to put your arm in a cast, and uh, you're probably going to have to wear it for about eight weeks. Um, but when we get finished with you, you're going to be good as new. And the man said, well, doc, that's really good news, but do you, do you think when I get out of the cast, I'll be able to play the piano? And the doctor said, well, I don't see why not. The man said, that's awesome because I've always wanted to play the piano. <laughs> so you never know how God will meet us in our broken place. And that's what we're going to talk about. How he meets us in times of brokenness. In our darkest nights, in our deepest valleys, in the wilderness, in our grief, in our weariness, in sickness, in exile, in abandonment, in loneliness, and in trial. Now I'm gonna tell you the main point of my message. 
I don't want you to stop listening after I say this, but this is really at the core of what I want to say. Your brokenness is not a barrier in God's purpose for your life, but it is an opportunity for him to invite him into your life, into your broken place, to create something new and something beautiful in you. Your brokenness is not a barrier to God's purpose in your life, but it's an opportunity to invite him to come in and create something new and beautiful in you. Do you believe that? Some of you do. I'm struck as I read scripture by the fact that so many women and men in the Bible went through wilderness times and they found God there. They found God in the wilderness place. You think about it. I can't give a a complete list, but let's just talk for a second about a few. There were Abraham and Sarah who left their home to journey into the wilderness. There was Hagar who was sent out with her baby into the desert, but God brought forth water in that desert place and he met her. There was Moses who was in exile and then there was Israel in their years of wandering. There was Naomi and Ruth in the wilderness of loss and insecurity. There was Job in the wilderness of death and despair. There was Joseph in the wilderness of betrayal and captivity. David had many wilderness experiences where he found God there. John the Baptist prophesied in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and yet he was filled with and led by the Holy Spirit. My dad spoke about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch encountering God and God's purpose in the wilderness. And Paul was in the wilderness of preparation for ministry for years. Wilderness and brokenness need not be the end of your journey, but they can be a doorway into a new season of God's grace and providence. Now that ought to be good news to some of you because you find yourself in a wilderness place right now. And nobody nobody ever prays, oh God, send me into the wilderness that I might meet thee. (laughs) You notice tonight and during the conference and every Sunday in your churches, we don't, we don't have a lot of songs that I can think of about the wilderness. Rejoice in the wilderness. It's so happy here. It's hot and I'm thirsty. Glory to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that to Bethel and see if they can do something with it. Sometimes... I want to talk about strength and weakness for a minute, and that's really kind of a tough subject sometimes for us as charismatics to to discuss. We don't even like to think about it because it's a negative thought, and I rebuke that negative thought in the name of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. (laughs) We like to be positive thinkers, positive confessors. We, We want to believe that once we receive Jesus, Once we're full of the Holy Ghost, we're now free from trials and temptations and weakness. Maybe maybe some think that if we can just live holy enough, if we can just have enough faith, if we can just pray hard enough, if we can just use the right formula, then we'll never have to experience brokenness or a wilderness season. Well, the fact is, even in the saving of our souls, 
we still inhabit a mortal body. We still live in a fallen world. It is being redeemed, and we're part of God's plan of redemption. But there is fallenness all around us. And even the finest Christians, the finest Christian you can think of or know, will experience weakness or loss or brokenness and ultimately death until Jesus returns. Now, I knew this wouldn't be the part of the sermon everybody would jump on their feet and clap, so it's okay. Um, But that's reality. How many of you know that's reality? It's okay. It's okay to say it. It's true. But, praise God for our blessed hope of eternity in him. Praise God that he came to give us life and life abundantly. Praise God that even in our times of brokenness, we have a faithful God who will meet and mend us if we will make room for him to work. Now let's look at the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. This is Paul writing. He says, The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. Now Paul's been dealing with a thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what that was, but it was bugging him. And he's praying and praying that God would remove it. And the Lord doesn't say, I'm going to remove the thorn. It's interesting. The Lord said, Paul, son, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, you know, there's another passage of Scripture right there that we, we've never put to music. Um, you never see Pentecostals do a victory march around the sanctuary with that song. Um, but how many of you know that's the Word of God? How many of you know that's good news? It is. Let me say this again so that it gets down in our spirits. Your brokenness is not a barrier to God's purpose in your life, but it's an opportunity to invite him in to create something new and beautiful in you. You know, the the Bible really is just the story of God redeeming mankind. From beginning to end, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of healing. Some of the most treasured testimonies that we have are when God takes that which has been broken and recreates into something beautiful for our blessing and for his glory. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about healing and restoration. Psalm 147 And by the way, if it's okay with you, I'm going to give a lot of scripture tonight. I hope you don't mind. Uh, What I'd like you to do, you may not remember a whole lot of things that I have to say, but if you would make note of what the scripture says or make note of the scripture so you can go back and, and look at them later. And this is another good one. I like this. Psalm 147, verse 1. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant. And praise is beautiful. Praise is beautiful. Could we say that together? Praise is beautiful. Then he says, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the 
most important and wealthiest and, and strongest and best looking people. Outcasts. Thank you, Paul. It says, he gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He counts the number of stars and calls them all by name. Great is the Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. So here's something that I see right away. Our healing and our restoration happen in a spirit of praise and recognition of God's sovereign, redemptive purpose. The Lord is building his kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And how is he doing that? He's building it upon lives that have been broken. He's building it upon the outcast and the rejected, the abused, the wounded, and the hurting. These are those that God comes for and seeks out. And when he looks at them, he sees a kingdom being built. He sees healing. He restores us in his glorious and gracious purpose. There's a, a great story in the book of Nehemiah, and I really wish I could read all of Nehemiah and all of uh, Ezra. If you'd like to do that at some point, it would be profitable. But in Nehemiah chapter 4, after Nehemiah has returned to Jerusalem and those of faith with him have joined their hearts together in purpose to rebuild the walls. And their enemies were so delighted and so hospitable and welcoming that they were there doing this thing to see the restoration. Well, that's not what Scripture says. It says in in verse 1 of Nehemiah 4, But it so happened when Sanballat, he's one of the baddies in this story, when Sanballat heard they were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and very indignant. He mocked the Jews. He spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burnt? That's what they had to work with. It was rubble. It was burned stones. But how many of you know Nehemiah was given that mission from God? And he wasn't too worried about what the critics had to say. Neither was God. So Sanballat is mocking them, and he's belittling the burned and broken stones. Sometimes that's, that's all a critic can see is our broken places. They look at us like we're rubbish. Now, his buddy is named Tobiah, Tobiah the Ammonite, and he wants to chime in You know, when I picture these guys, I picture... How many of you have ever seen uh, the movie A Christmas Story? Anybody? You don't have to be embarrassed. I know all of you have seen it probably 40 times. Let me ask again and, and let the spirit of lying be gone from this room. 
How many of you have seen A Christmas Story? Okay, all right, there you go. So when I picture Sanballat and Tobiah, what I picture in my mind every time, and I can't help it, is Scott Farkas and Grover Dill. You remember them? Scott Farkas had yellow eyes, and he was a bully, and Grover Dill was his little toady that ran along beside him and agreed with everything Scott Farkas said. So Sanballat Farkas here has just made fun of the building project, and now here comes uh, Grover Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, <laughs> if even a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. Now Nehemiah prays to the Lord. He's not even going to respond to their yakking. He goes straight to the Lord. He says, hear, O our God, for we're despised. Turn their reproach upon their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. See, Nehemiah understood that all that little chit-chat that was going on with, with Grover and Scott, I mean with Sanballat and Tobiah, he knew that they weren't insulting Nehemiah. They weren't insulting the Jews. They weren't even insulting the stones. They were insulting and rebelling against the purpose of Almighty God himself. And that is a dangerous place to be. God looked at it all very differently. Sometimes we experience battle or brokenness in our lives. And at the end of a season like that, well, maybe we look like rubbish. I looked like rubbish when I woke up this morning, but that's another story. Maybe we look like rubble. Maybe we are burned and broken. But in our brokenness, the healer comes. The architect comes. The creator comes. The builder comes. The artist who spoke the very cosmos into existence comes into our brokenness. He weeps in our weeping, but he rejoices in our restoration. That Jerusalem rubble, those burned stones, they were repurposed and they were joined together in the restoration of the city of God. Interesting, even Jesus himself, it is said in Psalm 118 and repeated in Acts 4:11, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. Jesus, the son of the living God, born of a virgin in a manger in an occupied land, announced his life mission and the fulfilling of prophecy in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, and I'd like to read that. So he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath day and he stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight 
to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable or favorable year of the Lord. Then Jesus closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is the immovable, unshakable cornerstone upon which all other living stones are built. He is the living water in a dry and thirsty land. He is the way where there seems to be no way. He is the miracle worker. He is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. Glory to his name. I want to talk about grace. Jesus is the personification of the grace of God. Jesus is the personification of the grace of God. If you want to know what grace looks like, if you want to know what God's grace looks like, fix your eyes on Jesus and look to him, and we'll see it. I, I love how the message reads uh, in this passage in Romans 5, verses 18 through 20. Listen to how Paul describes Jesus and what he's done for us. Here we go. Paul says, here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all into this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. But one man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was to produce more lawbreakers. But sin did not and does not have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness that we call grace. It's okay to shout. It's all right. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins, hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, but that's the end of it. Grace because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on. A world without end. Amen. Praise God. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did and does and still is doing. The New King James puts it this way. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. What is grace? I once preached eight weeks on grace and didn't even begin to scratch the surface, so I'm not going to be able to do justice to that word in the next five or ten minutes, but let's just have a quick overview. According to Strong's Dictionary, the word used for grace in the original Greek and the language of the New Testament is charis, which comes from root words that mean joy and to rejoice. It is the word for the grace of God that's extended to sinful man. It is unmerited favor. It is undeserved blessing. It is a free gift of God to us. Now, charis is the root word where uh, in modern times we get words like uh, charisma or the word charismatic. 
But our friend, uh, Bible teacher Ern Baxter, often said that having charisma in the modern sense of the word is no guarantee of character righteousness. We see this daily. We're reminded of it, sometimes in our own lives. Charisma that is divorced from character is a recipe for deception and disaster. So, if I'm reading that right, and I'm a simple man, I'm just a simple man. But if I'm reading it right, according to the New Testament, a true or authentic charismatic, as we've looked at the definition for grace, a an authentic charismatic ought to be a person who has received the free gift of the grace of God and is now extending that same grace to others as they live and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. That sounds like a biblical definition, does it not? And yet, If we asked many people in the world today, some who are tired and weary and burned out on religion, if we asked many of these people to describe an American charismatic today, I wonder if they would give it that same definition. Actually, I don't have to wonder because I've asked that question and got hundreds of responses most of which are not suitable to share here with a family audience. Much to my grief. We have to recover something. Personally. We need a fresh encounter with God's grace in our own lives if we have any hope to be able to extend it to a world that is lost and dying thirsty and hungry I'm so thankful his grace is available if we'll seek it grace is not simply a New Testament concept I always get irked when I hear people talk about the New Testament God and the Old Testament God ladies and gentlemen God does not have a split personality He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is ever faithful and ever true. In the New Testament, in the original Hebrew language, the word grace is translated into the word chen. I have to work at that, chen. When I I looked at it, I thought it was chen, but to really be authentic, you got to Get that in there. So it's chen. It means favor and grace, graciousness, kindness, beauty, pleasantness, compassion. Uh, It can mean dawning, like the dawn. I think that's interesting. I like that. It can mean affectionate regard. Grace is not simply something that God does. But it's at the core of who God is. It is the very fabric of his nature. I said grace is the very fabric of the nature of God. When the Lord declared his name to Moses in Exodus 34, the Lord said that his name is the Lord God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Exodus 34, 6. Now, mercy and grace are both part of who God is, and they are both related to one another, but they're both distinct acts of God. Sometimes we use them interchangeably. And that's okay because English is a weak language. But the truth is, each one is a specific and has specific meaning.
I love how author Philip Wajaya differentiates between mercy and grace. He says, mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment, while grace is the act of endowing unmerited favor. In his mercy, God does not give us punishment that we deserve, namely hell. While in his grace, God gives us a gift that we do not deserve, namely heaven. So mercy shields us from the punishment we deserve and grace leads us into favor that we do not deserve. Does that make sense? Well, let's talk for a moment about restoration. We've talked about brokenness. And sometimes we're broken because of the actions of others. Sometimes we're broken because of actions that we've taken, things we've done. I want us to understand right now that God's primary interest is not finger pointing. You're broken because somebody hurt you, but you're broken because of your own stupidity and I don't care. No, that's not how God sees. God is concerned for restoration and renewal. When Jesus looks at you, he doesn't simply see your present brokenness, but he sees your future wholeness in him. And he loves and receives us even in our brokenness before he heals us. God doesn't just love us after we're all fixed up. He loves us in our brokenness, sometimes in our wretchedness. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. We quote that. I think we believe it. But I can't get my mind around it. I've been a Christian for more than 50 years. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit for more than 45. But I can't get my mind around that. Why would the Son of Righteousness, why would he step out of heaven and come and live as he lived and die as he died. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, raise again. Because he was our ransom. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. That's what he did. He reveals himself to us. He calls us to repentance. to change our direction, to follow him. And then out of repentance, he brings times of refreshing. Now, in recent years, I'm not the most sophisticated person ever, but I have become interested in the ancient Japanese art of kintsugi. Kintsugi is a very interesting process that not only has an artistic value, but it tells a story, a redemption story. And I don't normally quote Wikipedia as a primary source, uh, but in this case, 
having researched it elsewhere, uh, I think Wikipedia puts it pretty accurately and sums it up nicely, what kintsugi is. That word, kintsugi, literally means golden joinery or golden mending. It is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with a lacquer that is mixed with powdered gold or silver or platinum. As a philosophy, Kintsugi treats breakage and repair as part of the history of that object rather than something to disguise. Something to celebrate rather than focusing on absence or missing pieces. Now that is absolutely fascinating to me. I can't help but see that that's somehow a picture of the gospel. I have some pictures, I don't, I don't know if we have them or not, of examples of kintsugi and what it works and how it works. But kintsugi is pottery that has been broken. Normally when you, when you break a piece of pottery or you break a plate or a bowl, that's the end of that. You throw it away. And if you can, you try to replace it with another plate or another bowl or another cup. Kintsugi is different. Instead of throwing away the broken pieces, they are mended together once again. And not by hiding the broken places or the missing places, but filling them with gold or silver which creates beautiful new patterns and becomes part of the story of that vessel. When you look at that, you know that it's been broken. They're not trying to hide the seams or disguise that it has been broken. But somehow in its brokenness and in its restoration, it has become something entirely new and something even more beautiful than the original. And for any of you art collectors out there, something much more valuable. Now, usually when we make repairs, uh, we don't want anyone to see the cracks or flaws. If, If we've had some brokenness in our lives, I mean, it's embarrassing. When I stumble and fall, when I sin, when I make mistakes, when I cuss, when I get mad, it's embarrassing. I don't want, to, I don't want anyone to know about that, <laughs> which is weird because I just told all y'all, but y'all don't let that out of this room. <laughs> Maybe too late for that. And, and we want to patch it up but patch it up in such a way that nobody sees. We want God to fix it all up and nobody knows about our past. But somehow, well, somehow it seems like that's denying the testimony of what God's done for us. You see, all of my own righteousness by itself is just filthy rags. Whatever righteousness is within me is all from him. And it's okay to tell people that. Kintsugi doesn't hide the breaks. It creates beauty amidst the breaks. Even as it joins all the pieces back together into a strong whole. I see a lesson here about how God works in our lives and leaves us not only whole, but with a story of good news to tell others who are also broken. The old vessel is made new with greater beauty and value that it had before. 
Pastor Gerard said a lot of wonderful things this morning. How many of you appreciated his message this morning? Amen. I loved it. He said something really simple uh, but profound. He said, give Jesus something to work with. Am I right? Did you say that? Okay. Just making sure. Give Jesus something to work with. Just give him something to work with. Well, maybe all you have is shattered and broken pieces of your life. Maybe that's all you have to give him. Maybe it's your tears or your grief. Maybe it's your fear. Whatever it is, Jesus says, bring it to me. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. Bring it to me and watch what I can do with that. Maybe all you have is just a widow's mite. Maybe it's just five loaves and two fish. Maybe it's just a jug of oil, your last jug of oil, and a few borrowed vessels. Help me, Lord. Can you believe? And and I'm asking you, can you believe that he can take whatever it is that we offer to him and work miracles with it? Yes, he can. Yes, he will. Can we say with that father in Mark 9 whose son was tormented by demons, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. One of the greatest statements of faith. I believe, help my unbelief. Now that's an honest man. Jesus could work with that. He gave that to Jesus. And Jesus did a miracle. Bill Gaither wrote the classic Song more than 50 years ago, very simple. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful out of my life. As he makes us whole, we become a vessel for his glory. And that vessel then pours blessing out upon all of the people in our lives. So why would we try to hide our testimony? Why would we not want to tell people what the Lord has done? Let it shine. Let it shine. My last point is the music of... (coughs) is a sneeze. But then after that... I want to talk about the music of our lives. You know, in 2020, I, just like probably all of you and most people, went through a lot of significant challenge and transition in my own life. During that time, our good friend and CSM board member, Michael Coleman, released a coaching program, and he called it Accelerate Through Transition. Accelerate through transition. Have any of you been through trans- transition in the last 10 years in any way? Could you raise your hand? Good. I don't feel so lonely now. It's not that I want you to suffer or be in duress. I just, it just helps to know I'm not alone. Uh, Mike said some interesting things. And again, I recommend the, the course to you, MikeColeman.com. It's excellent. But one of the things Mike said was, in transition, some things go up and some things go down. These ups and downs are like waves. Waves have a peak and a valley. 
My dad talked a bit about that last night. John 3.8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Mike Coleman follows up and says, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit working in a believer's life produces a sound. The Holy Spirit working in someone's life produces a sound. God takes us through the ups and the downs to write the music of our lives. Now, Mike not only founded Integrity Music and is a tremendous worshiper, but Mike uh, is a skilled musician, and he understands music. And he gave this picture of the ups and downs of musical notes and the scales and, and that in our lives we go through these ups and downs, but in that, God is writing the music to our lives. The different notes are producing a song in our lives. And I don't know if that hits you like it hit me, but that really hit me. And I realized God's still writing the song. And, and in, in his song, for me, there may be some low notes and there may be some high notes, but the end result is going to be a beautiful song of praise to him. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, all of us have experienced highs and lows. This is the rhythm of life. But the rhythm of grace is when we recognize God's presence in every season and we walk with him through it all. And you know what? If we can't walk, we can ask him to carry us. And he will, even as he heals us of our lameness. One of the finest memoirs, one of the most uh, personally affecting memoirs I've read uh, is the recently released book by Beth Moore, All My Knotted Up Life. Suzanne and I count Beth as a friend. And we have great appreciation and respect for her. And we know some of her story, but there were a ton of things in this book that we didn't know and most people didn't know about her life. And like Kintsugi, Beth shares about the broken pieces of her life and how God mended her with the finest gold. It's an exceptional story. It moved me to tears and also laughter. And again, I recommend it. Uh, Another great storyteller that I'd like to mention actually grew up here in these mountains, right here in this area. And you know her heart is still here. More than 50 years ago, she wrote a short story about growing up so poor that she didn't have a coat. And winter was coming soon. Well, someone gave her mama a a box of old rags. Seemed almost worthless. But her mama saw something in those rags. And she took those rags and, and made a coat out of them to keep her little girl warm. And when the little girl grew up, She took that story and set it to music. And that's how Dolly Parton wrote the beloved classic song, Coat of Many Colors. If you've heard the song, you know the story. As her mama would sew those rags together, joining these motley pieces of cloth together to make something special, to to do it in love. She told little Dolly about Joseph in scripture and how he also had a special coat of many colors but according to the story when when dolly went to school 
She wore her new coat. She was so thankful for that coat. She felt so beautiful. She felt rich in her coat of many colors. But some of the kids laughed at her and made fun of her and mocked her. Well, she decided to tell them about Joseph in the Bible and about his special coat. And she closes the song with these wise words. One is poor only if they choose to be. Now I know we had no money, but I was rich as I could be. In my coat of many colors, my mama made for me. I love that song. That song gets me every time. That song came up on my playlist. I kid you not, it wasn't playing. It came up on my playlist just as we drove into Sevier County. <laughs> we crossed over the French Broad River and Dolly Parton sang Coat of Many Colors. That touches me deeply. It also makes me really mad. I, I, I just want to drive around the area and find those kids that were so mean to her <laughs> and ask him, do you know Jesus? In our brokenness, in our seeming lack, all Jesus asks is that we entrust to him everything that we have. And we believe that as we give our lives to Jesus, in whatever condition we might be in, that he can take us and he can do in us something that is more beautiful than we could ever imagine. Do you believe that with me tonight? Now, you know, I really prayed about what the Lord wanted me to do here at the end of the meeting. And I have a general idea. <laughs> but I'm stepping out in faith. But I believe that there's some folks here tonight who are dealing with brokenness. Um, or walking through a wilderness. And you've come here this week thirsty. Thirsty for the Holy Spirit. Thirsty to know afresh of his love for you and his care for you. Thirsty to be free from the condemnation that the enemy would seek to put upon you. Thirsty to be free of the hopelessness that the father of lies would whisper into your ear and tell you that your best days are behind. That it's over, that you ruined it, that you blew it. I'm here not only to say that the devil is a liar, but I'm here tonight to stand with you in prayer and believe God for the restoration of your vision, for your healing and for all that God wants to do in your life. Because I'm telling you, if you are in this room tonight or if you're in the sound of my voice, God's not finished with you. And your brokenness can be a doorway into a glorious new season of beauty in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, uh, I'd like us to just bow for a moment in prayer. Father, this word is your seed. I've sought in the best way that I know how to take that seed and sow it. And now, Lord, this is your time to do what only you can do. And so I'm asking, Lord, tonight that your Holy Spirit would move through this room and Lord, that we could sense your healing touch once more. In Jesus' name, amen.